There is no state in the Union, hardly any spot of like size on the globe, where the man of color has lived so intensely, made so much progress, been of such historical importance as in Louisiana, and yet about whom so comparatively little is known. Alice Dunbar Nelson, 1916. The history of the whites and slaves is well known in Louisiana, but there was a third caste system. They were not black, nor they white. They were not slaves, nor were they entirely free. I think the phrase free people of color uh, reminds me um, of the somewhat distinct status the United States had, or that Louisiana has within the United States. When I hear the term free people of color, actually a whole lot comes to mind. It depends on what region of the world you're in, what region of the country you're in, um, and how it's defined. If we're focusing on Louisiana, it is actually quite complicated. Because in Louisiana, you had free people of color, and you had Creoles of color who were usually free. Not all the time free, but usually free, and there's a ethnic distinction between the two groups. And free people of color, or uh, les gens de couleur libre, or, uh, whichever term we use, uh, was often used to indicate people who had um, European and African ancestry, uh, and who occupied, sometimes legally, sometimes culturally, um, a sort of liminal status, but a status that was different from other people who, uh, other people of African descent who might have been free. They were Catholic. They helped establish the uh, Catholicism here. They worked the land to establish farms for things. They were willing to pay taxes. They were willing to do whatever they needed to do to be in this new space. In terms of thinking about a geography uh, that comes to mind uh, when I hear the term free people of color, I think most commonly I think um, slave societies in the Western Hemisphere who have a history of colonization by Catholic empires. Uh, Catholic empires, uh, particularly the French Empire, the Spanish Empire. Uh, so I tend to think of places like Louisiana in what became the United States. I tend to think of uh, Saint-Domingue, what we might call Haiti today, um, and other places sort of in the Caribbean, and Central and South America in particular. One region I think about is Haiti. It had a huge free people of color population. Locally, I think about New Orleans. New Orleans had a huge free people of color and Creole color population that was incredibly influential to the state, um, to the city. It, the art that came out of those communities, the politics, the religion, the merchant, the um, mercantile relationships, so much came from these people that we know very little about. Because of the role of the Catholic Church uh, and the tendency of the Catholic Church not to lead to better conditions under slavery, which was absolutely not the case, but to lead to more fluidity in moving from an enslaved status to a free status, uh, or uh, giving different statuses to people who were born of interracial unions and things like this. Uh, because of this long history of French uh, and Spanish control in Louisiana, Louisiana had one of the largest populations of free people of color in the United States all the way up through the eve of the Civil War almost 60 years later. Free people of color and enslaved people were distinguished by a huge number of factors. Uh, the obvious distinction is in the term free people of color, right? Uh, it, which is freedom was a great distinction. They were not slaves. That's it, that's it in a nutshell. Free people of color were not slaves. They either bought their freedom they were born in, or they were born into freedom. 
but they were not slaves. So understanding the, the jobs and occupations of free people of color, particularly in the context of the United States, is a, sort of a complicated task. Uh, so there's a broader answer in New Orleans, in Louisiana. Uh, there's an idea that free people of color could fill more positions and occupy more roles in society, um, in real estate, in law, in professions, in um, business, um, and even on a pretty large scale in slave owning. Um, they were politicians, they were authors, they were newspapermen, they were everything that you could think of. Some, that, some of them did that, that, that kind of work. Not all of them. I mean, there were obviously those who couldn't have those more prestigious jobs, um, especially for women. It was really hard for women, as is the story immortal. <laughs> it was really hard for women. You know, they were clean. They were maids. They were seamstress. They were nannies. They were wet nurses. They were whatever they had to be to get by. If you look at almost any aspect of society, economy, or culture, uh, and you look carefully through the records, you will find free people of color there. Uh, you can find this in famous cases. Uh, if you look at, for example, literary history of Louisiana, uh, you can find um, Armand Lanous and others who called themselves uh, Les Sennel or the Hollyberries, who published uh, a book also called Les Sennel, of poems. There were free people of color who held huge numbers of enslaved people in slavery. Uh, Andrew Durnford, for example, uh, was a well-known free person of color who owned a plantation, I believe called St. Rosalie, about 30 or 40 miles south of New Orleans on the Mississippi River. For free people of color in New Orleans and Louisiana and throughout the United States, there were <laughs> obstacles that were almost hard to count. Uh, at the most basic level, there was the constant, especially outside of New Orleans, need to prove your free status. Um, as we know, uh, most of the United States operates under what is often called a one-drop rule, uh, I, making pro anyone with any um, semblance of African descent, someone who's eligible for slavery. The fact that they weren't allowed to vote, the fact that they had to endure ridiculous um, hurdles to own property and to simply have the basic human rights imposed on their ability to be successful. Of course, you know, laws for women, laws on appearances, like the team, the um, Tigon laws. All of these things just put up more and more barriers of separation and oppression. And uh, Governor William C. C. Claiborne reduced the number of free men of color in the militia and the colony. Uh, he set curfews, made free people of color carry passes, they were identified differently in public records, and so on. The 1830s brought decline. White Southerners worried the free people of color would work with abolitionists. Race distinction became more important than legal status. Free people of color left for the North, Haiti, France, and Latin America. Uh, many others also passed as white. During the Civil War, free people of color were on both sides of the conflict. Some were property owners and had a great deal to lose. So when the Civil War happened, and you're looking at the class of free, pe free people of color, um, it disintegrated because the only distinction was slavery. And you take slavery away, then what is the difference? During Reconstruction, the free people of color played a major role in advancing the fight for civil rights and suffrage of all black people. PBS Pinchback 
<laughs> is definitely a historical figure worth noting. He is the first black governor in the, all of the United States of America, and he was the first black governor of the state of Louisiana. He was elected during the Reconstruction era when a number of black men came into political power um, throughout the South. Plessy v. Ferguson is a case that everyone has at least heard of in some format. And this is the man whose case created the separate but equal um, law, which became the segregation laws throughout the South. He voluntarily violated a law on a passenger train. He decided that he would buy, with his own money, a first class ticket to ride this train in Louisiana, and he would not sit in the black section because theoretically he was not black. He told the conductor, I'm seven-eighths white. I should not have to sit in the black section because I'm mostly white. And he was arrested. And he took it to the Supreme Court and he was and he lost the case. But out of that came this concept of one the one drop rule, one drop of black blood makes you black, separate but equal. It's difficult to pin down exactly where the descendants of free people of color are today in the sense that the southern United States have seen dramatic transformations, um, especially with people of color in terms of migrations out. Louisiana has seen a little bit less than some other places. Um, but to this day, if you look at the politics and culture of New Orleans, you can quite clearly identify descendants of the free people of color. You can trace names down through the histories. Uh, and much like in the 1800s, free, free people of color play a large role in New Orleans. So, they're everywhere. Um, the question is, how do you know if you're a descendant of a free person of color? M on my father's side, my family are descendants of free people of color. Um, one of his ancestors was a merchant, and he came from Haiti to America. But when you look at Creole, Creoles of color, you have a clearer chain of ancestry, essentially, because you have people marking Creole on the boxes when you look at the census records. That is a thing, or mulatto, or there's something to denote, because that's an ethnic distinction. When you are not ethnically different, when you're a free person of color, your box is probably just marked Negro, colored. There's also the issues with census takers, much they got wrong, or communities they just didn't even go to. But just because there's no record doesn't mean you, does not mean you don't exist. You do exist.